combined with some of the previous lectures, uh, also the fact that many of them never did any econometrics. <laughs> it's not uh, too bad. Um, also, it's a great honor to follow so many distinguished people and uh, the ones who are to come. You mentioned a couple of them, and uh, it's indeed a uh, great honor to be in that company. As Sergey also mentioned, I'll be happy to take questions. Of course, uh, I don't promise to answer them, but I'll be happy to take them. <laughs> Generally, the topic of uh, all three of these lectures is uh, economic governance, and I'm sure you've heard of it. This is a concept that 30 years ago was uh, absolutely non-existent. Uh, there are just four, I think, in fact, I found one more uh, since then. In the 1970s, there are just four sites to that in uh, the economics literature. And see how fast they've grown from the list that's projected up there. <clears throat> As happens with uh, buzzwords of this kind, everybody understands it a little bit differently. So there's no point trying to reconcile these different me meanings. I'll just to give you my meaning of it, and that will set the stage for the way in which I'm going to be using the concept. Basically, by economic governance, I mean everything that goes on, the institutional structure, the organizational structure, uh, the mechanisms, etc., uh, underlying or supporting economic activity and economic transactions by performing the functions of protecting property rights, enforcing contracts, and establishing a variety of infrastructure things, both physical and organizational, that are important for transactions to succeed. Also, as soon as one says that, uh, it's uh, kind of almost uh, inappropriate for someone from the outside coming to Moscow talking to Russians about economic governance, because, I mean, we kind of study it, research it, etc. You live it. Uh, the kinds of things I'm going to be talking about are uh, things that you come across in everyday conduct of business, government, etc., etc. So I'm sure it's going to be the case that uh, many of you have a lot more experience, a lot more ideas, even uh, research that I don't know about that may be going on, or some that I've missed before, I would love to hear about that. I would love to hear uh, anecdotes, uh, ideas, uh, theories, empirical evidence, etc., that either supports uh, the kind of thing I'm going to, or maybe doesn't support it. Uh, send me an email if you don't get time to either meet with me or ask questions. I will on the other hand, I will be able to bring some case studies, some ideas, some theories, etc., um, that you may not know about, that, that, that pertain to other countries, other periods of history, etc., etc. Some well known, some not so well known. It will be the case, I think, that uh, that will be basically uh, the division between these three lectures will be that uh, today I'll focus mostly on case study material, which will be the motivation for some theoretical work I'll be talking about on Wednesday and on Friday. Wednesdays will be mostly kind of uh, received theory things that we uh, have a reasonably good models of. Friday will be questions that uh, are suggested by the case studies, but the models of those so far are uh, for one reason or another, not all that good. And so that maybe will give you some ideas to some of you for carrying out research along those lines, and maybe I'll pick up some suggestions from you on how I might do some of that research. Info and info, by the way, will appear uh, tomorrow, I mean on Wednesday. Economic governance I want to contrast with corporate governance, a seemingly similar thing. And uh, the difference I want to maintain is economic governance is about uh, when it comes to contract enforcement, also it comes to some extent to property rights protection. 
is about transactions that take place among distant economic entities, different economic entities, different firms, different people. Whereas corporate governance is about uh, interactions that take place within a firm or at most between the firm's management, workers, etc., and its shareholders. All kinds of agency problems that exist between shareholders and management, uh, between management at the upper level and middle level, etc., those are corporate governance issues. But of course the two are related because what is an economic entity, particularly a firm, is itself endogenous. Uh, as uh, Coase and Williamson pointed out, uh, various transaction costs determine whether certain activities are better organized inside of a firm or left for different firms to transact with each other in markets. And governance, we'll see, is a form of transaction cost. So in cases where uh, economic governance between different economic entities is of bad quality, there'll be a case for carrying out those activities within one entity through internal relational methods of governance. And as soon as you see that, you start to understand why it is that, especially in less developed countries, uh, you see these firms that have not carrying out multiple activities that seem to have nothing to do with each other. So in India, Turkey, a number of other countries, you have uh, even family-owned firms that have, on the one hand, a consultancy service, on the other hand, a steel mill, uh, on the third hand, a car factory, etc., etc., that are seemingly just completely different kinds of activities. You don't see a reason why they should be together, except that profits generated by one are kind of most reliably invested in another, because within a family firm, you have the certainty that that asset will not be expropriated by somebody else to whom you might give it, uh, even in principle, socially more efficiently for use. So large conglomerate firms, and as a result, a certain kind of fragmentation of the capital market are consequences of governance costs. And we'll see a number of things of this kind as we go along. The one thing I want to emphasize uh, right at the outset, and in fact, this is my big interest in this whole area, is that governance is not always, or perhaps in some cases, even in many cases, identical with government. To be sure, governments are important, and they do provide, they try to provide, many of these institutions of economic governance. They are particularly important for protection of property rights, and if the governments fail to protect property rights, in fact, if the government or its agents are themselves uh, predatory, trying to deprive people of their property. That can be a serious problem. But there are many other non-governmental methods of achieving economic governance. In many cases, and in particular situations of contract enforcement, they can step in where the government is not doing a good job. They may not do a perfect job, but there may be an improvement over an inadequate government. They may have, because they have deeper knowledge of the industry in which they operate, a uh, better ability to interpret various uh, facts. They may then supplement the government's institutions in some pretty nice ways. And it's absolutely important to know these alternative institutions, a variety of social uh, groupings, networks, norms, etc., etc. Uh, arbitration, adjudication systems, and even private enforcement systems. Uh, giving a verdict, as it were, and carrying it out can also be done privately. And it's important to know this for a variety of purposes. One is uh, if you are, let's say, an American businessman who comes to India or China or Russia for that matter, it would be a terrible mistake to think that, hey, just like in America, you can go and deal with anybody, write up a contract, and if things start to go wrong, at the worst, you can go to a court and expect uh, 
reasonably efficient, reasonably prompt uh, adjudication and enforcement of that contract. It's just not going to happen in these countries, right? And the business person should know it in advance and know how to deal with it. Uh, you know how to deal with it, but uh, m m many foreigners don't, and it's important for them to know that. Governments in these countries and advisors to governments in these countries coming whether from the IMF or the World Bank or from other governments should know this. If they don't, uh, and we'll see the way in which things can go wrong, they basically have in mind an idea that the right way to do this is to have a structure of the law like they have in America or like they have in Western Europe and they'll try and replicate that in these other countries, write its constitution, write its laws, etc. And then two or three years later, they'll be very disappointed it's not working. Should have known ahead of time. Maybe there are not many more countries left to mess up for uh, these advisors coming from the outside, but uh, uh, still it's possible that lessons learned will still prove useful. And lastly, even in advanced countries, uh, the kind of uh, idea of the government and its legal system providing economic governance is somewhat of a myth. Even in America, there's a great mixture of systems. And to understand this mixture, it's important to understand the way in which these systems of private governance operate, the way in which they interact with the governmental systems, etc., etc. And intellectually, for me at least, perhaps the most exciting part of this uh, area is the very nice way in which it brings together all kinds of different social and even natural sciences. You get uh, research done by lawyers, done by political scientists, done by sociologists, anthropologists, evolutionary biologists. All of that bears on these kind of issues and you can learn from reading work done by others, and on the contrary, as economists, we can contribute to ideas coming from game theory, coming from our knowledge of markets, etc., etc., back to those. So, if you are the kind of person who is a little bit sorry that these social sciences split up into different disciplines that can talk to each other, here's a way in which that can be remedied. So let me very, very briefly talk about uh, the kinds of situations I'm talking about and the kinds of institutions I'm talking about. The kinds of situations that need governance are first of all uh, predation, <coughs> where one party simply tries to take away the uh, property or the fruits of uh, economic activity of another party. And uh, the special problem here is that uh, the predator may be the government or its agents. Then there's a whole variety of contracts, which are of exchanges. And we have in mind a kind of classical economic exchange in a market where two people who never met each other before come together one gives a good or a service to the other, and the other gives back money. Instantaneously that's done, uh, the good is of perfectly known quality, so uh, you can immediately check and see that you're getting value for money, and the other person is getting the money. No problem, but uh, governance almost not needed. The minimal that's needed is that uh, the carrier of goods is not robbed on his way to the market, and uh, not robbed to any takes the money back home and the other way around. But if you think about it, in any economy or any society, the vast majority of transactions are not like that. And the most extreme departure from that is a gift exchange, where you've done this numerous times and happens even among businessmen. You do somebody a favor and you say, you owe me one, or the other person will say, I owe you one. Owe you what? When? 
that's just left completely undecided. And my best example of this is from the movie The Godfather. Everybody seen that? Almost everybody, right? So, right at the beginning of the movie, remember the undertaker comes to Don Corleone and he wants uh, him to avenge his daughter's dishonor. And remember the way it operates. Uh, Corleone first asks, uh, why should I do this for you? All these years, our families have known each other. You've never invited me for coffee. You've never called me godfather. Why should I do you this favor? Finally, when the guy becomes a bit contrite, uh, he agrees. But even then, not quite used to the ways of the world uh, that he's operating in, he asks, uh, how much shall I pay you? And remember what Corleone says. This is classic. He says, uh, one day, my friend, and may that day never come, I'll need some small favor from you. Until then, accept this as a gift from me on my daughter's wedding day. Then when the Don's son is killed and he wants the undertaker to fix him up nicely so that his mother won't see his face all shot up and so on, he calls back the favor. Is the exchange too little or too much? Who's to decide? Uh, you simply cannot think of this transaction taking place in the classical economic market, right? Uh, you can't imagine the undertaker advertising uh, or going to a market stall for hitmen. And, yeah, just, just not on. And governance of these kind of things is extremely difficult, even apart from its kind of setting of violence and whatnot. Uh, deciding what's the right exchange, <coughs> whether it's been fully paid or overpaid or underpaid, very difficult. These kind of things can only happen either in very, very close settings like a family, where there are these uh, exchanges of favors going back and forth all the time, so that more or less over time it washes out. Or one of the parties has the power to say, hey, this is what I want. And in this case, of course, it's the godfather. So here's just an kind of extreme example of the way in which uh, governmental governance, formal law, simply could not operate. It's got to be done through a uh, non-governmental institution of governance of this kind. But there are others which have kind of similar features, which uh, might be of borrowing and lending, where uh, even though the quid and the quo are separated in time, it's pretty well decided how much you have to pay back, and uh, then there may be extreme circumstances in which you can. There may be renegotiation. Mm -hmm. Contracts are highly incomplete, they're very difficult to kind of lay down formally and force formally, etc., etc. Uh, this creates uh, the kinds of problems that Williamson and Grice have talked about. Then um, there's the straightforward uh, exchange of goods, maybe even goods for money, where the quality of the good is not known in advance. And uh, maybe the payment is delayed, so the certainty of payment is not known in advance. These could be enforced by a formal system, but maybe there are circumstances again in which it could not. And here again, uh, the best example is a mafia-related one. And this comes from Diego Gambetta, an Oxford sociology professor who carried out a wonderful, really rich ethnographic study the Sicilian Mafia. And right at the beginning, he uh, cites this cattle rancher who tells him that when a butcher comes to buy an animal from me, uh, he knows that I want to cheat him by selling him a poor quality animal. And I know that he wants to cheat me by reneging on the payment. And so both of us need Pepe, his third guy, to bring us to agreement. And we both pay Pepe a commission. I'll speak more on this uh, as we go along, but this is another nice example of the way in which Pepe is providing governance and not the Italian government. Then there are a variety of uh, public good problems, etc., in the usual kind of way. And all of these things from B through E are basically a variety of two-person or multi-person prisoners' dilemmas. 
and for governance of them, we need all the usual kind of apparatus plus some other things that we need from business directors. Thing I want to emphasize is that all of these uh, are conceptual categories, formal governance and informal governance, uh, uh, predation situation versus a voluntary contract situation, etc., etc. In reality, you will always find some kind of a mixture and uh, the conceptual categories are there to help us think in clean terms. They're not meant to be literally descriptive. In the same kind of way, there are uh, different kinds of mechanisms of governance, which are also conceptual categories. In practice, two or more of them might be in operation at the same time. And I like to classify them into first party, second party, and third party. First party are the ones that stop the problem from arising in the first place by operating on the value system, the utility functions, the payoff functions of the person who has the temptation to cheat in the first place. So if you successfully instill a kind of pro-social preferences in people, they would not cheat in the first place and the whole problem would go away. You don't normally think of this as a method of governance. It's actually governance by uh, acting before the fact, taking precaution to stop the problem from arising in the first place. And if you think about it, societies do a whole lot of this. Uh, that's what socialization of children in families, schools, etc., is all about. And uh, Experiments that are carried out, the ultimatum game or the dictator game type experiments on children show this very clearly that really young children up to the age of five, something like that, are very, very selfish. And uh, almost the first word a child learns after mom and dad is mine. Uh, it's only when they're like eight or so that they gradually start to uh, start thinking in terms of equality, fairness, etc., etc. And this is done deliberately. We ought to think of this as a social governance mechanism. And to my mind, this is a good way to have economists uh, interact with sociologists. Economists have always said preferences, whatever they are, whether they be purely selfish or pro-social of the kind that behavioral economists are these days finding out, they're just exogenous, and they're not. Preference formation is an outcome of a social uh, learning, education, etc. process, and uh, it's time economists squarely took that on. Second party, I mean here, they, these are the mechanisms where uh, the transactors themselves, and I don't mean literally just the two who may be involved in a transaction right now, but the whole group who might be involved in similar transactions uh, through time. So maybe like an association of business people or uh, society. Achieving governance by ensuring that the cheater pays some cost in the future. Not being able to deal with anybody else in the society would be a form of those of you who have read Greif, I should say that this is not exactly what Greif means by second party. What I'm saying, uh, uh, what I'm calling second party, Greif calls collectivist. But, I mean, that's merely a matter of nomenclature. Whereas by third party, I mean this is done by somebody who's no direct part to the transaction. So this is like Don Pepe called in from the outside. And Don Pepe can do a variety of things. He can provide information. He can tell the uh, cattle rancher whether the butcher he is proposing to deal with has uh, paid up uh, properly in the past. And he does that by just hanging out with the crowd and knowing everybody. He can also, or his associate can also, adjudicate. Uh, so you take a complaint and they'll find whether that complaint is true or not. And this is like acting as an arbitration court. And arbitration courts, in fact, exist in many industries as another internal governance mechanism. 
And lastly, he can do direct enforcement. He can tell the butcher, that's all right, go and deal with this guy. And if he doesn't pay you, come and tell me and I'll go and smash his kneecaps or whatever. So he, he can, uh, the court might levy a fine, uh, Pepe can inflict other forms of punishment that might be even worse. And of course, you can think of formal law as an external enforcement mechanism. Anyway. So, um, with that setup, I want to take you through just a few case studies of exactly this kind. Think about case studies. By the way, they are, uh, case studies have got a bad name, right? Uh, that are not systematic, uh, they don't have the kinds of control variables that econometricians would want, etc., etc. And people who do case studies have found a good way of getting around that by calling them not case studies, but analytic narratives. You must have seen this uh, becoming increasingly common. So to take them in that spirit. Learn what you can from them. Uh, they're, they're not uh, going to give you statistical significance but they're uh, going to give you good suggestions, and well done, they're going to give you an extremely rich, fascinating set of uh, questions, ideas, etc. to think about. But one of my favorites is a study of the Sicilian Mafia done by Diego Gambetta, which I mentioned, but also it goes back uh, before him and since him there Others who've done related kind of studies of mafias in other countries, or the Sicilian mafia before, or the American mafia. There is a non kind of social science type book by Ripetto. All of these things are uh, listed at the end of uh, this set of slides, and I suppose they'll be posted on the website somewhere, yeah, so people can uh, look them up. Ripetto is a fascinating book. So all of these uh, mafia-type organizations basically arose when the state had one way or the other collapsed. The Sicilian mafia, um, when the feudal system in Italy had collapsed, but the Italian state had not uh, taken its place to any extent. Uh, some people doubt whether it's taken much of place even now, but uh, that's a separate question. The Yakuza in Japan came in right off the end of the Second World War, where uh, basically the Japanese government had completely collapsed, the Americans had not yet come in, but people needed to do some kind of deals, basically to eat and live, and uh, it was the Yakuza who started markets, actual marketplaces where people could meet and trade <coughs> with uh, some underlying governments. The Sicilian Mafia actually started as a property right protection system. So landlords, particularly absentee landlords, who own land uh, out there in the countryside of Sicily, but themselves lived in Palermo, uh, were wanted to make sure that their land didn't get appropriated, their cattle didn't get rustled, etc., etc. There's a lot of banditry. What to do? To basically hire the toughest of the bandits to be your guards. And that's what they did. And then uh, these individual bandits gradually formed together into an association. And uh, what happened? Turns out that there is an interesting negative externality. So if half of the land is protected, and of course the protectors have every incentive to advertise this fact, uh, so and so's property is protected by me, where are the bandits going to go? they are going to go to the other half. So, at the margin, if you go and hire somebody to be your guard, you are increasing the probability that somebody else's land or somebody else's cattle will get hit. And that makes it even more important for them, themselves, to hire one of the guards. The difference between the value with a guard and the value without a guard increases the more properties are protected. If everybody is protected but one person, he's going to get hit all the time. And knowing this, the mafia has the ability to charge very high fees for their services because your payoff, if you don't hire the mafia, is very low. 
And so the mafia is able to extract a very large amount of money from people in this way. And they can make an example of this uh, by deliberately, for kind of show purposes, leaving some properties unprotected, not protecting 100% of the properties. So they'll be able to kind of uh, easily demonstrate to people, hey, if you don't hire me, you'll be in that bad state. And Pantiera, a very nice paper, uh, does this uh, very explicit. Another thing that comes up is this is a situation where monopoly is actually better than oligopoly. Because if there is an oligopoly, basically, in this case, literally cutthroat competition breaks out among the different would-be protectors. And of course, then their lifetime horizons are short and uh, discount rates are high, therefore it's harder to get them to behave well themselves. Now, interestingly, when you think of Sicily in this context, you speak of the Sicilian Mafia. You think of Russia, it's always the Mafias in blue, right? So that may have been a problem. Uh, may, maybe all these different Russian mafias should merge. <laughs> and uh, yeah, people say they did. <laughs> so we uh, also yeah, some people so also say we the government is involved. So so the merger did that actually reduce uh, the kind of problems that existed before? Of, uh, it's hard to judge, but probably. Yeah. Huh? Okay, then maybe it's a little bit update and uh, maybe that problem has already been solved. But <laughs> there, there's an interesting IO problem. The mafia itself sometimes engages in the activities it protects. The mafia can protect drug trade or it can actually trade in drugs themselves. Gambetta says that protection is the kind of central function of the mafia. It's an input it provides to the drug trade. And if it actually chooses to carry out some or all of the drug trade itself, this is just downstream vertical integration. Straightforward I.O. question. And maybe uh, you want to think of uh, this choice of whether to engage in that activity yourself as an I.O. question, particularly because, interestingly, in the U.S., apparently, it went exactly the other way. Ripetto's history of the American mafia says that uh, the Sicilian immigrants who came there basically started out uh, in illegal activities themselves, gambling, prostitution, all those kind of things. Uh, later on, um, uh, the um, liquor trade during Prohibition and providing protection services was a kind of ancillary thing they started to do later. What about protecting against uh, predation by the government or government agents? Here the classic story is uh, told by Greif, Milgram and Weingast. The problem is this. Uh, in medieval Europe, there were these all city-states and uh, let's say the rulers in one city, or Ghent, might be particularly tempted to rob, uh, the, the, let's say, expropriate in various ways, a trader who came over from, let's say, Florence to Venice to trade there. A single trader can do very much to resist that. What about all traders getting together and saying, um, no, we'll resist this? That itself is a little bit problematic because um, it's a free rider problem. If all the other traders are boycotting the ruler in Ghent, a single trader will get attractive deals from this ruler. He'll say, look, uh, um, <clears throat> deal with me and I'll treat you uh, on really very good terms. So I've got nobody else to deal with from your area. You deal with me and uh, I'll see you right and that may be tempting. So you need a kind of penal clause with a second round of punishments. 
you need all the traders to agree that anybody who breaks their embargo against the ruler and deals with him will himself be in violation of the group's norm and subject to uh, nobody else dealing with him. And basically, in principle, you need a third and fourth layer kind of elaborate structure like this. And that can be sustained, that can be a self-sustaining equilibrium of the repeated game of all these traders with the ruler. And actually, even the ruler, before the fact, would prefer this to be in place. This is typically the case with moral hazard problems. In a lot of moral hazard problems, in fact, you might say even in most moral hazard problems, ex ante, everybody wants an efficient, enforceable arrangement that will stop that problem arising. It's exposed that each of them has the temptation to renege and uh, become a free rider or cheat or what have you. So, uh, ex ante, even the rulers would be happy to have this group, the guild, set up this system because that will then uh, <coughs> increase the volume of trade that comes their way. Now the question is, can similar kind of things be done today? So let's suppose that the uh, government is corrupt and uh, you can get a contract by bribing officials. How about all the business people get together into a confederation of business people and have a penal code whereby anybody who gets a contract by bribery, nobody else will deal with him. And uh, that, that of course means that he won't be able to deliver on his contract because he needs uh, suppliers, uh, associates, etc., etc., to fulfill the contract. There's a free riding problem. So, what if somebody cheats and gets a contract uh, by um, corruption and other people start to deal with him anyway for the profit it brings? Then nobody deals with them either. And it's at least conceivable, logically, in principle, that there could be an equilibrium of the system which will stamp out corruption. Will it work? I don't know. I threw out this suggestion in India where there is a reasonably good grouping association of business people. They said, oh, who knows? It might work, might not. Uh, don't know whether it will work in Russia. It works a little bit in Princeton, where there is uh, not a corruption problem so much as a cheating on exams problem. And there's an honor code that says that if you caught another student cheating, you have to report him or her to the honor court committee, which is actually a committee of students, which will then hear the case. And if you see somebody but don't report, that itself is a violation of the honor code. And somebody else who saw you see somebody else and not report, can report you. And that's an equally serious offense. Does this work? Uh, people are 50-50 on this. But maybe worth trying. Okay. Then a whole variety of uh, collective action problems. And uh, these are basically in areas like uh, use of common property pool resources, uh, whether there will be excessive depletion of fisheries, or uh, also in private provision of public goods like building of uh, bridges, irrigation, things of that kind. Here there is a very large number of case studies that were carried out by Eleanor Ostrom and her uh, students, colleagues, etc. <clears throat> there are also studies carried out by lawyer Ellickson and the political economist uh, Gary Lifecap, huge number of others. And uh, I want to bring out a set of kind of points that come out of many or all of them. The most general is uh, the immense importance of local information. The people on the ground who are actually involved in these activities 
know a whole lot of things and in a whole lot of detail that outsiders don't. And that kind of knowledge is important in various ways. First of all, you have got to know who a member of the group is. You have to know the identities, you have to know how many, etc., etc., and that's got to be reasonably stable over time. So in a fishery, you've got to know in principle who are the people who are entitled to take the fish. You have to have pretty well specified what are and what are not the permissible activities. When are you allowed to go out and fish? When are you not allowed to go out and fish? What size of boat are you allowed to have? What size of nets are you allowed to have? Etc. Etc. And also it's got to be clear what happens if you violate those norms. It's got to be clear if you don't do what you're supposed to do or do what you're not supposed to do, what will be the consequences for you. So you can judge things right. And you've got to be able to detect whether somebody cheated or not. And finally, you've got to have the right kind of incentives to convey this information in a truthful way. So you should have the incentive to report cheaters, but you should not have incentives to falsely report cheaters. So you should not have the case in Princeton that somebody who just had a fight with somebody else goes to the honor court committee and says, so and so cheated on an exam. Uh, the consequences to the false reporter of doing that have to be serious enough. Now, this is a kind of problem that uh, is often quite hard to solve, partly because uh, taking the actions is costly. As it were, you are inflicting punishment on someone on behalf of somebody else, or you are taking part in a punishment at a cost to yourself. This may get solved by what I was mentioning a little bit before as first party systems. And Ernst Fair and some of his colleagues have done these experiments which show that uh, people actually have an almost instinctive, internal, built-in preference uh, for punishing social cheaters to the extent that they'll be willing to incur some private cost in order to do so. And maybe that's done precisely in order for these kind of uh, systems to work better than they otherwise would. However, another interesting thing comes out of studies. If you thought of these as repeated prisoner's dilemmas, the structure of punishments would basically be, this is the kind of principle that comes to us from Abreu, etc., that the harshest, the most severe, subgame perfect punishment will sustain the most cooperation. Right? And the extreme example of this is the grim trigger strategy where uh, if any time anybody cheats, the whole thing collapses right away to the Nash equilibrium of uh, single play. You need to modify this a little bit if your detection system is imprecise. So there is some risk that uh, on the equilibrium path, the punishment will get triggered. This is the green porter and subsequent uh, kind of game theory models. But subject to that, subject to the imprecision of your observation technology, you still want punishments to be as harsh as possible. And that's not at all what happens in successful systems in reality. They're much more graduated. So Ellickson, who did this wonderful study of uh, cattle farmers in Northern California, what if somebody else's cattle come on your uh, property and do some damage? You don't go and hit back. You make a phone call and say, look, your cattle were on my property. And you say, well, how much damage? You say, $150. All right, I'll send you a check. Only if that doesn't happen, you go to next stage. You badmouth this guy to all the neighbors. And if even then that doesn't work, very interestingly, you are allowed to go and do some damage to his property. <laughs> you are not allowed to take property in compensation. Why not? If you are simply allowed to go and take $150 worth of his uh, hay, you might be tempted to make false accusations. 
it's much less likely that you would make a false accusation for the sake of the pleasure of going and doing $150 worth of damage to his property. So this seemingly inefficient, this seemingly pointless wastage is actually good from the point of view of sustainable governance. Second very important aspect of this is that the punishments you have, or even the rules you have, have to be compatible with your information technology. And here's an example of that. Let's suppose you wanted to uh, reduce the risk of overfishing. What would the standard economic analysis say? It would say establish a quota. And in fact, quota are actually tried. And they don't work very well. Why not? Quotas on the amount of fish are extremely difficult to observe and monitor. Uh, how do you really know how much uh, fish is being offloaded? Uh, well, one boat might go somewhere else where there isn't a monitoring station, all kinds of things. Your norm of what you're allowed to do has to be consistent with the information that's actually available. And so in this case, these are like seasons. What days of uh, the month or what months of the year are you allowed to have? What size nets are you allowed to have? What size boats are you allowed to have? These are the kind of things that actually are used by fisheries. And to the extent that anything works with fisheries, that's very difficult anyway because fish move from one place to another. Fisheries are not localized. They're not like forests. Uh, so fisheries are actually harder to control anyway, but to the extent anything works, these are the kind of things that work, not the quotas that an economic theorist might immediately think of as the natural thing. Okay, with that let me uh, say a little bit about contract enforcement. <coughs> And here, basically, uh, it's customary to uh, differentiate two types of enforcement mechanisms, two types of governance institutions. And they're what Grice calls collectivist versus individualist. Collectivist are uh, groups where uh, pairs of people meet and deal, and if there's any cheating, the whole group will inflict punishment on the cheater on behalf of the victim. So the classic example of this is the group of Maghrimi traders that Greif wrote about. And uh, I'm sure everybody has read that uh, in some detail. There the idea was that uh, you uh, assigned your goods to somebody else to sell on your behalf at great distance. And if he did not uh, do the job to the standard that was normal in that society, you wrote letters to all the other traders saying so and so is no good, uh, and to the extent that that was believable, they wouldn't deal with him either. By the way, in history as in economics, uh, things change all the time. And just in the last few months, I've seen two papers which very seriously criticize Greif's account of the Maghrimi traders saying that it wasn't like that at all. Relationships were mostly bilateral. There was a great deal of use of outside courts, etc., etc. There is a very nice uh, PhD thesis done by a history student uh, at Columbia, Jessica Goldberg, who's now a, a assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And there's also a European paper by Edward M. Ogilvy that some of you have seen. So uh, again, I was saying that all these things, the conceptual categories, the reality is much more complicated and mixed. Think of Greif's Maghrimi traders as a conceptual category rather than a really literal account of what went on in that society. Greif's Genoese traders are uh, likewise a conceptual category, but maybe at least so far uh, I haven't seen any critiques of that. Uh, uh, there, the idea was much more formal. Contracts were bilateral, written, complaints were taken to the authorities in Genoa, etc., etc. 
And uh, to explain these ideas theoretically, uh, Hong Kong economist Shu He uh, developed this very nice distinction between the relation-based, what Drive called collectivist, and rule-based, what Drive called individualist governance. These ideas that relation-based governance has very low fixed costs. So you don't need any kind of elaborate structure. You deal with people you have dealt with for a long time, have long-term relationships with, so you can operate on uh, um, exchange of favors-like system almost. Then you start dealing with people you know less well, and you have to go to some kind of an investment to establish that level of relation. So the marginal cost of expanding your business is increasing. Whereas for a rule-based system, you have to have a large amount of fixed costs, you have to pass laws, you have to set up courts, all that kind of thing. But once that's done, you can deal with people who are strangers, and so the marginal cost of expansion is not large and not increasing so fast. And so naturally, a low fixed cost, rising marginal cost system is preferable at small volumes, and the high fixed cost, low marginal, constant marginal cost system is preferable at large volumes. Nice clean distinction. I've myself done some modeling, which I'll talk about tomorrow, which uh, goes into a little bit richer detail of what's the nature of this increase in marginal cost, and I'll attribute that to decay in the quality of information. But the same thing then brings up a number of issues that have uh, not yet been particularly theoretically satisfactorily examined, but uh, are, uh, to my mind, good topics of research. And I'll just mention a few of them as uh, time permits, and um, <clears throat> leave more of, uh, of the modeling, etc., for uh, Wednesday. So first of all, there are the obvious problems of transition. So suppose uh, the <coughs> size of transactions is increasing. A time will come when the uh, relation-based governance becomes too costly and it becomes efficient to switch to the rule-based system. Can that be done easily? There may be problems. Maybe people have put in sunk capital of relation building, etc., etc., that they're not willing to make use of, and therefore they'll resist the replacement of their relation-based system by a rule-based system. There may be problems of linking together these different relation-based communities. Greif suggests a kind of hierarchical structure, which again brings out quite nicely the idea of the way in which available information limits what you can do. So his story is that there are traders going from one place to another, like in my example earlier from Venice to Ghent. So somebody who goes from Venice to Ghent to deal isn't really known in the other place doesn't really have a long history in the other place. What's to stop him from cheating? The point is that even though people in Ghent don't know exactly who this person is, they can tell he's from Venice. Because in those times, even different cities had very different modes of dress, uh, modes of speech, uh, kind of food, where you stayed when you came to train in a strange place, etc., etc. So the people in Ghent would then write to the uh, top level traders in Venice saying that one of your guys cheated one of our guys. You, as Venice, pay up for that. And of course, uh, the truth of this. Uh, needed to be ultimately verified, but if there was a relation-based system that was good enough, Venice would pay up, and then they could, if they wished, make the internal inquiry and say, which of our guys went uh, over there in February a year ago, uh, and uh, they then hold him personally responsible. But this is a kind of hierarchical system where at first the relationship between the two top-level authorities does the governance, 
and then within each there can be separate relations as well. <coughs> Next thing is that even though these kind of transitions uh, may take place efficiently, may not take place efficiently, even efficiently they're never going to be complete. It's always going to be the case that there are some things that are better done in a non-governmental way. These are examples of various industry-based arbitration systems that have efficiency advantages. Uh, Lisa Bernstein, another law scholar, has excellent studies of this among various industries in America, particularly the uh, New York Diamond Merchants Club. I don't know how many people have read about that, but at least very quickly the story is uh, that they try and resolve all disputes internally. And if there are two people involved, A and B, and they declare that A is at fault and should pay $10,000 uh, compensation to B. If A refuses to do that, they'll post A's picture and name on the bulletin board of their club in New York. So everybody can immediately see this is a guy not to be dealt with. And this is very serious punishment. They're basically putting him out of business. And not only that, uh, these people are socially connected. They're all... Uh, Orthodox Jews whose families know each other, etc. And that really is a terrible punishment. Uh, 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 basically, your family gets ostracized by all these other traders' families, and your kids start to complain. Our friends won't talk to you, Daddy, because of what they talk to us, Daddy, because of what you did. Uh, that's serious punishment. And uh, this seems to be more effective than the fines that courts could impose. Now, here's a slightly uncomfortable thought. Let's suppose you have uh, this kind of uh, group-based structure that carries out its governance to solve a prisoner's dilemma problem. And the punishment is that uh, the violator will be thrown out of the group. To make this more effective, you have to make the consequences of being out of the group as bad as possible. <coughs> what will happen if you're out of the group? You will have to try and go and mix with some other group. And you want that to be terrible. So it's almost the case that intra-group governance can only be improved at the cost of inter-group conflict. And I kind of wonder how general this proposition is. Is it the case that some kind of a situation of conflict between groups is unavoidable for better maintenance of peace within groups? This may be, in a sense, a really, really big question of political economy, of history, etc., etc. Who knows? Um, okay, here's one quick last thing. Uh, the, 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 I'll leave the rest uh, for, for people to read. The, 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 this is a great deal of fun. So, one of the ways in which uh, you can decide, take kind of before the fact precaution of whether or not to deal with somebody is to try and judge whether that person is going to be honest or not, to the extent you can. Find some information. <clears throat> this problem comes up, believe it or not, for taxi drivers. 99% probably in most situations of uh, people who hail taxis just want to go where they want to go, they'll go there, they'll pay their fare and uh, leave. In a small number of cases, they'll try and rob the taxi drivers or uh, steal his taxi, or maybe even kill him. So how is a taxi driver to know whether a person approaching is honest or not? A lot depends on it. Okay? The problem is made even more complicated by the fact that if there was a kind of uh, criterion for establishing honesty. So let's suppose somebody wearing a coat and tie was likely to be an honest person. 
You wanted to rob a taxi, what would you do? You would wear a coat and tie. <laughs> so this is a classic pension signaling and screening problem. And the same Diego Gambetta and the co-author carried out this wonderful ethnographic study of taxi drivers in New York and uh, Northern Ireland, Belfast. Belfast is a problem uh, especially because for kind of religious uh, reasons, uh, taxi drivers got killed. So what do they do? Interestingly, one of the things that's done is multiple signals. So someone wearing a coat and tie, just kind of hailing the taxi at a random uh, spot on the street, is not by itself all that reliable signal. If that person was seen stepping out of an office building, that becomes more reliable. Right? So in general, what you want is a high difference between the two types. And in the Spencian signaling or six screening story, it would be a difference in the cost. Anybody can buy a suit. Maybe coming out of an office building is a little bit more difficult for a dishonest person because office buildings have some kind of a security and they'll check uh, the person who is already there. Why not push the idea of spends, that it's the difference in cost of the action for the two types that makes signaling or screening separation possible to the limit? What if that cost is infinity? What if it's literally impossible for a bad type to imitate a good type? That would be great, right? And actually, Spence did discuss these kind of things. He called them indices. They're unalterable characteristics of the type. Nobody reads this anymore because people don't read Spence's original articles anymore. But he did discuss this. And uh, indices really are exactly signals where the cost of signaling is infinity. So what are these things? And it turns out that there are little, little micro expressions that people simply cannot avoid if they're lying. Psychologists did this. They uh, put people in lying situations, filmed them, and then viewed those films in single frame freeze till they could figure out these expressions. And they then became quite good at reading them in real time after a while. And same kind of way, taxi drivers, those who survive in the business for length of time, that is, <laughs> and of course they are the ones that uh, Gambetta selectively, of course, interviewed. That's bound to happen. Uh, he recognizes this, by the way. It's not enough that I read this interview. He knows this. Uh, so um, they tell him, Oh, we can just tell by looking at a person whether he's going to be honest or not. And that's exactly what they're doing. So the, 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 this kind of uh, ex-ante precaution, choosing who to deal with, is itself a kind of uh, direct uh, help in the problem of governance, if you like. So let's see if there is... Uh, Okay, I already told you about a number of these kind of things of uh, Gambetta. <laughs> and I'll leave you with uh, one thought uh, to think about. Remember I said that Gambetta's done Pepe does two kinds of things. He can either provide information or he can actually do enforcement. Turns out that the fee for providing information is 2% of the deal. So the Gambetta, uh, Pepe will tell the butcher or the uh, uh, cattle rancher about whether the history of the other side is clean. The fee for the enforcement service, the kneecap smashing service, is higher. Gambetta doesn't say how much higher, but it's higher. So now you might think of all kinds of explanations for this. You might say, oh, obviously, kneecap smashing is dangerous business. Uh, the person might get up and get back. Uh, maybe the Italian police will get to you if you inflict physical violence, etc., etc. Those are all cost-side reasons. 
But this factor is a territorial monopolist. In fact, I mentioned that monopoly, in fact, was in a way to, uh, more desirable or relatively less undesirable form of organizing mafia type governance. Why should a monopolist price that cost? He'll price what the market will bear, basically. So you need demand side explanations for why the kneecap smashing service gets a higher price than the uh, information providing service. And tomorrow I'll build a model that offers actually an answer to that question. In the meantime, those of you who haven't already uh, read the material might want to think of possible reasons for that. Okay, so I keep saying tomorrow, but by tomorrow I mean Wednesday, we'll uh, come back and look at some of these models. So, thank you very much. We have about 10 minutes for questions, suggestions, your ideas, etc. Et questions? Uh, yes, please. There is a microphone. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was really interesting to see so many facts, interesting facts and questions. But my questions, maybe it's a above what you have already said, I believe that uh, you will uh, uh, present next time a lot of interesting models which uh, have already analyzed these questions or try to analyze. But my question is more general. So what is the um, main purpose of economic government? So do you really believe that the, the modeling of these facts will help to facilitate alternative governments or to help uh, uh, to establish the structure in order uh, in order to uh, alternative structure to the existing government. Um, a mixture. So first of all, uh, let me repeat the emphasis I gave uh, earlier, which is uh, governance is not just about government. So maybe it can help uh, business associations develop uh, better internal methods uh, with better understanding. So the, the kind of uh, control of free riding problems I mentioned, uh, the way in which uh, existing information can be used, uh, and. Um, <coughs> Mistakes not made by trying to make rules that are not compatible with existing information, like quotas in fisheries. Mm -hmm. Some of those kinds of things are possible. The other possibility, of course, is uh, the way economists might believe that all the things that are worth doing have already been done. <laughs> Maybe they have, and uh, all we can do is understand why uh, certain things exist the way they do. Uh, probably reality is somewhere in between. <clears throat> probably there are some hundred dollar bills lying out there, uh, but not as many as uh, non-economists would like to believe. <clears throat> More importantly, in kind of strict business-like terms, it's particularly tricky for people who come from a system where the formal governance is working well into a system where it's not working well. At the worst, they might get uh, cheated and robbed blind. At the best, the kind of thing that happened uh, to Americans trying to do business in Japan, they never really succeeded. They said, hey, we are having these dinners and going to bars every evening for three months and still they haven't given us a contract. <laughs> so, in a relation-based system, you have to check out your partner to the extent that you can maybe read those fleeting expressions in the partner's eyes, or uh, maybe a screening device. Uh, is the person willing to put enough of a cost in building this relationship? that uh, somebody who just was there for a quick profit would not put in. Um, so quite likely there is a reason why the Japanese were having those dinners for three months. 
and one of the ways these people might have um, <coughs> done better is to spend some effort in acquiring better understanding of the way Japan operates, the way in which um, <coughs> one can get an entrance into the group, which might be done, for example, by taking on a Japanese partner. That's one possibility. Now here, actually, my guess is that people who go from one relation-based system to another have somewhat of an advantage. Because even though, let's say, an Indian businessman going to Japan might not know exactly the way the Japanese relational system operates, he at least knows that there is a relational uh, system, and he needs to understand it before he can operate successfully. And uh, studying this kind of thing maybe will give uh, American, or more generally Western business people, a uh, better prospect of success in alternative systems. So those are some of the possibilities. To yes, Vladimir. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my question is about your attitude towards the much-discussed article by Asimoglu, uh, Johnson and Robinson, Colonial Origins of uh, uh, Economic Development, I guess it's called, right? Yeah. And it seems to me are saying a different thing. In their article, they argue that institutions, yes, were set by colonial powers in those, con in those countries where the settlers mortality rate was low enough. Right? So it was worth to make an effort to set good institutions. So they argue that you know institutions uh, uh, do make a difference for economic development, and that's why the differences in economic development are such as they are. It seems like you are arguing a different thing. Yeah, maybe I'm trying to push mm. too far, yes, your argument, but would you agree with this or not? You are saying that there should be a certain combination which is predetermined between formal institutions and informal, between rule-based institutions and tradition-based institutions. And once you uh, do not uh, observe this combination, once you try to destroy the traditional institutions too fast, right, you get a pretty bad result. You try to, the, uh, colonial powers did it in Africa, in Latin America, just you know, generalizing very much, right? In maybe our region, right, yeah. in former CIS, whereas in East Asia or in MENA countries, the institutional continuity was much more uh, you know, much more pronounced than in other regions of the world, in other less developed regions of the world. Is it uh, the argument with which you would agree, or in any case, what's your attitude towards this article about colonial oh, origins? Your argument, I agree with 100%. I don't necessarily see that as uh, directly linked to Asimov and Johnson Robinson. Uh, it may be linked to the extent that if you buy their, as it were, historical determinism 100%, then you would say, well, nothing can be done. But uh, th th there's no reason to buy that. Uh, th there is reason to buy the idea, in fact, I'll, in uh, tomorrow's uh, public lecture, I'll elaborate on this rather more. There is reason to buy the idea that, uh, well, when you make changes, you want to try and ensure as best as you can that they'll actually work with what's actually there. And also, when you go there, you should go there with at least the attitude that what's there might be there for a good reason. It's not always true, but at least sometimes it is. And uh, you ought to at least uh, think of that as a possibility and not come there with a predetermined idea that whatever was American was the best or whatever was British was the best and that that's the way everywhere should be like. So uh, I think you were saying more or less the same thing and that part I agree with absolutely 100%. Thank you very much. Could you elaborate a little about the interactions between formal and informal institutions of governance? In particular, you already just alluded to a little bit the fact that there are very, uh, there's a very important concept of entry barriers when you have uh, informal institutions of governance. Because you really, if you're excluded, that should be this function. So, yeah, th this way really direction, this way causality is so clear. The question is more about the, the other way causality. So if you have very good formal institutions, does it help or hurt the, the informal
formal uh, institutions of government, governance. You know, obviously one can give different examples, but mm -hmm. is there a general pattern of any way you see? Uh, no, I've seen kind of, uh, in a way, the uh, question could be phrased and is often phrased is uh, whether formal and informal institutions are substitutes or complements. And I've seen examples. So generally, arbitration systems seem to have a good complementary relationship with uh, uh, formal systems. So the, the government's courts know that labor arbitration systems or these kind of uh, diamond merchant type industrial arbitration systems have information interpretation advantages. Uh, so once those arbitration forums have made a decision, the courts will not rehear the case. They will uh, they stand ready to implement it. So if uh, you defy the arbitration tribunals, uh, with the fine imposed against you, the other party can, if they want, go to the court and say that the arbitration tribunals imposed this fine, make the guy pay up. And the courts will do that. And uh, similar kind of relationships even in the case of some international arbitration forums. Uh, there's one based in London, one based in Stockholm, and all that kind of thing. Uh, national governments will just stand ready to implement their decisions. <clears throat> and so in that sense, the two work nicely as complements. The other cases in which one can hurt the other, and actually I myself have just one example where uh, uh, partial improvement in weak formal governance by reducing the bad consequences of falling out of the relational system makes cheating more attractive and so worsens the performance of the relational system. Uh, so this is a way in which it's almost a problem of the second best. Uh, short of being really good, a little bit better formal system can actually hurt you. So, uh, no, I have examples both ways, but no general theory of it. And the last question, and we'll have, uh, afterwards we'll have a cheese and wine and cheese reception where you can address uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah. formal. So then the last question. Yeah. Maybe I just don't understand something, but uh, my question is about, uh, you said that uh, this will come that uh, non relation system will win. I mean, do uh, the transaction cost or something? Um, no, or rather the other way. Let's say, as uh, the volume of business expands, as the size of transaction expands, ultimately, the rule based system, which has got low marginal cost, will be the more efficient one. The, that's the kind of general presumption. But uh, the relational system will still retain some advantages, so it will not go to 0%, but uh, will ultimately become smaller. So why can't just uh, every producer in the relational system become proportionally bigger then? Why, why, why grow additional producers? Oh, uh, new activities come up. Uh, the, both will happen. Uh, the producers will get bigger, sure. But uh, normally, so uh, the other thing is that the trade barriers fall and you start dealing with people in other countries. Uh, that will be uh, an expansion in the scale of the system. Actually, in a sense, your question is uh, exactly one that will be addressed in tomorrow's model. Uh, where people will be spread out along the circle. And there's a density along the circle, and there's a size of the circle. So what you're suggesting is in that model, an increase in the density of the circle, keeping its size fixed. And uh, the kind of expansion that ultimately will make the rule-based system preferable is an increase in the size of the circle. 